Hi everyone, uh, my name is Thomas Payne. I'm here to talk about uh, game co-monads uh, and an equi-rank variable homomorphism preservation conjecture, which is a bit of a mouthful, sorry about that, but uh, the title just pretty much describes uh, the, the two parts of the talk. So um, part one is on game co-monads, um, and this is building on work. Um, so there's one paper on the Peblin co-monad by uh, Abramsky, Dawa and Wang, and then there's another paper on similar co-monads, I think coming out soon, by Bramsky and Shah. So those are the things that I'm going to talk about in the first section, um, just to sort of um, be able to discuss the application to uh, a, a homomorphism preservation theorem, which is going to be a slight refinement of what was called the equi-rank homomorphism preservation theorem, uh, which was proved by uh, Rossman. Uh, so just to set the scene, uh, we'll be working in um, a category uh, of uh, relational structures. So we're going to have a finite vocabulary uh, of solely consisting of uh, relations and the associated category of, of um, sets which interpret those relations and uh, morphisms between those sets. Um, and then sometimes we like to talk about the category of um, those structures with an associated uh, distinguished tuple. Um, and morphisms between those which preserve not only the relations but also the distinguished tuple. Uh, and we're going to consider the uh, set of first order sentences uh, over the vocabulary sigma up to just first order equivalents. Um, and we're just going to consider that to be a post set. So we're going to identify things which are the same and have this order um, if one uh, implies the other. Uh, and we would like to pick out at the beginning um, the positive existential sentences, which are ones built using only exist uh, and and or. And uh, also we'll talk about formulas with, so, uh, sorry, so we'll talk about sentences most of the time and then sometimes talk about formulas with some number of free variables. Um, and we'll, these these formulas are interpreted by structures in C sigma with the, with the tuples interpreting the, the free variables. Uh, so a nice picture we can draw between um, between existential positive sentences and finite structures. Uh, sorry, this category is a category of finite structures on the previous slide, but I didn't say it. Um, is that of the canonical query, um, and the canonical query is a first order a positive existential formula, and it just picks out all of the relations that are true of a given structure. So we just take one quantifier um, for each for each element of the structure, and then we just take the disjunction of all of the relations that they satisfy. Um, and this is kind of you could describe this in a more abstract way. So it's the it's the it's the formula with these properties that is the um, it's the largest, uh, so it's the maximal positive existential formula according to this order that uh, A satisfies. Um, and we can phrase uh, almost all there is to know about it by saying that this is a surjective and full functor. Um, so it's, this is actually the sort of collapsing, if you like, of the uh, category FC sigma. Um, and this is an example. So if you've got a functor, if you've got a morphism, then functoriality is telling you precisely that um, the canonical query of B should entail the canonical query of A. Um, so what we're interested in doing is uh, seeing how this picture works when we consider different fragments of um, first order logic. So we can break down, first of all, by quantifier rank. Uh, so that's the nesting depth of quantifiers in a given sentence. Um, and we can also break down by the number of variables as well as quantifier rank. Uh, so number of variables, you do have to do this funny thing where you 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 quantify over a variable and then you, you know, at some point later uh, introduce a new quantifier using the same variable. So that means you have to forget uh, what it was before. So you kind of limited quantifier rank and then you have this other sort of limited memory or resource, if you like. Um, and we're going to see how this picture works that we drew before um, with regards to these smaller fragments. So the first thing we can do is define a sort of analog of the canonical query. Um, and so it's going to have this property. It's going to be the maximal um, maximal formula in LN plus that A satisfies. So that's property one and two. And we can define it in a much more direct way than before because uh, LN plus is actually a finite uh, post set, unlike uh, L plus, 
So we can just take the uh, disjunction of all of the formulas that um, A satisfies. And this also works for infinite structures, which is nice. Uh, but this is no longer a full functor. It's, uh, it's still subjective. Um, but so I've just sort of repeated it for emphasis on this slide. So we define this sort of 2n relation, which is kind of just the pre-image, if you like, of this relation here. Um, and so a homomorphism is not implied. So just because the uh, n canonical query of B implies the n canonical query of A, it doesn't mean there's a homomorphism from A to B, unlike in the previous case with finite structures. Um, so this is a kind of important relation in general in, um, in finite model theory and model theory. And uh, so it's, we're looking for the, the compositional structure behind this, if you like, in order to have a, a similar story to what we had before. So we can uh, look at those structures whose pre-image, who, sorry, whose who map into LN plus under the canonical query. That's another good place to look. Um, and those are structures with forest covers. So a forest cover is just a forest on the same uh, set. So a forest cover of a uh, structure A is a forest on the same set. Um, and the, 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 you have to pick roots of the forest. Um, and then you say that its depth is the length from a, the longest length of a path from the root to a leaf. And then if, if um, two elements of A ever occur together in a relation, then they must be on the same branch of the forest. So why, why, what's that got to do with restricted quantifier rank? Well, you imagine if you wanted to write, if you wanted to list the, uh, the canonical query out in the same way that we did before, but th this just tells you how to structure the canonical query. So you imagine just kind of writing it on this forest cover um, and this condition that um, two elements of A who occur together in the same tuple um, must lie on the same branch tells you that you're not going to miss any relations. Um, so this is quite important. Um, and so this is uh, called a uh, structure with who <laughs> the least n such that a structure has a, a forest cover of depth n. Uh, is called its tree depth, and this is an important parameter. And here's just an example. So I have my structure A, um, and I can give it a two forest cover. So if we look at, you know, let's say um, D, D is on the same, well, D is on the same branch as everything. So B is on the same branch as C and A, which is good. Um, and B and F, for example, are on different branches, but there's no, there's no relation between B and F. So the relations are only between the things that with arrows between them in the structure. Uh, we can put these together into a category. So we need to, we, you know, you could just take the subcategory uh, of C sigma, which is structures with forest covers, but we uh, get slightly more juice out of it than that by taking the category of pairs of structures and a forest cover. Um, and then if you want uh, a morphism between them, you need a morphism, obviously, of the underlying structures. And then you need to preserve what is the order that is induced by the forest cover. So really what you need is the branch relation being preserved. Uh, and we have then um, a, a pretty obvious functor that just forgets the relation. And what we're really interested in is the comonad that this will define on CN because uh, this UN has a right adjoint um, and the comonad has a, a lot of nice properties, the resulting comonad. Um, so in particular, so if we define EN to be this comonad, um, its co cleisley category is the thing that kind of completes the picture, giving us this full and subjective functor using um, the N canonical query. Um, so in other words, we, if I had this relation, this relation is now captured by a morphism from ENA to B. And co-algebras, again, because it is the, uh, because it is the co-monad arising out of this particular adjunction, a co-algebra will just be an N forest cover. Um, so this gives us the compositional relation that we wanted, and to boot, it gives us a categorical description of tree depth. Um, so in order to prove that such an adjunction exists, um, it suffices just to you know, give a construction of it. Um, 
and this is uh, you know a lot of stuff to take in, but this is just a concrete definition. Um, so you take lists of uh, non-empty sequences uh, of length at most n, um, and you define the relations on as to be the set, and then you define the relations on it to be um, where you take you say that two sequences are comparable if one is a sequence of the other. So you can imagine this being like two uh, elements lying on the same branch, if you like. Um, and then you say that, um, well, you also need to say that their last element, so this epsilon picks out the last element of a sequence, uh, and the, the relation should hold between the last elements. So there's kind of some intuition there that um, these paths may be uh, like subtrees of um, or subforests, perhaps, of En, are going to somehow correspond to co-algebras. Well, indeed, they do correspond exactly to co-algebras, um, like like we want them to, um, and well, co-algebras and, and forest covers, like we want them to. Sorry, <laughs> subtrees are going to correspond to co-algebras, uh, and they also correspond to forest covers, which is where that correspondence is going to come from. Um, so this, in terms of sets, it just is the list or the non-empty list co-monad on sets. Um, it's worth pointing out, so I, I didn't mention them, they just appeared on the slide, but there are these things called aerofoid frese games, which capture the uh, n-morphism relation. Uh, and we can equally have motivated this uh, definition by looking at strategies in the aerofoid frese games. So that's discussed in more detail in the paper. Uh, but it's nice to know that this is a kind of quite robust definition because you can arrive at it in more than one uh, way. So we can do a very similar thing um, when we also restrict the number of variables. We just have to carry along this restriction with us, uh, but it's not too complicated. Um, so how do we get, um, how do we pick out a structure whose uh, canonical query can be written with a most k variables as well as quantifier depth n, where it needs to have this thing called an nk cover. So an nk cover, uh, first of all, you have an n forest cover, and then on top of it, you have a labeling function. So if you want your, if you can only use k variables to talk about a structure, what happens when you um, relabel something is you, you forget the thing that you were talking about before. Um, so this condition, uh, here, I've written out in full. Um, so if you have two elements um, who you want to be related somehow, then they should lie on the same branch because it's a forest cover, and then one has to come before the other. Uh, so let's say A comes before B on the branch, um, then you can't repeat the label uh, of A on the way to B, including at B. So that's kind of saying, well, how do you, how do you then get this formula? Well, you just take the the label to be which which variable you quantify over to talk about the element. Uh, and the least k such that you can find an nk cover for any n is called tree width, and that's a very important and well-studied parameter as well. Uh, so if we just take a little example of that, so this is going to need at least three labels um, to, so we, we had this forest cover from before, and this will need at least three labels to forest cover it. So let's see why. Well, if you imagine uh, if I take a look at D, so D is going to have a label, let's say it's got a label one. Um, D and C have uh, as an edge between D and C. So that means that um, D and C have to have, uh, D and the label of D cannot be repeated. So B and C must have different labels to D. Uh, but there's also an edge B, C. So that means B and C have to have different labels. So between D, B and C, I need to have a uh, it's worth noting that if the, the, the number of labels that you need is always at most the, the depth of the forest. Um, so we can get a, a co-monad, and we'll call that PNK, uh, in a very similar way. So we get one arising out of some adjunction between this category of pairs of structures and NK covers, um, and then everything runs exactly as it did before. So the co cleisley category uh, will give us a compositional structure behind this nk morphism uh, and we can define nk uh, queries and so on um, and nk covers will tell us about tree width i suppose as well as tree depth if you ignore k and tree width if you ignore n um, and there's a corresponding game called the n round k pebble game um, and kind of as i noted 
uh, you can always, um, uh, if, if you don't care that much about uh, K, so you just want to get EN back, then you can actually use PNN because it's not a restriction to be able to use N labels to label a tree of depth N. Uh, so the sort of concrete description is very similar to before, but we need to carry around the labels of our um, elements within uh, P, N, K. So the universe is uh, sequences of length at most N um, of pairs A plus a label for A. Um, and when you define relations, so you need the following two relation, uh, two conditions as, as was there previously. And then you need to say that if um, SI is a subsequence of SJ, then the label, which is I've denoted here pi A, uh, does not occur again in the sort of suffix of S i in sj so sj is remember a super sequence of si uh, so you can't use the the label of si again in t which is the suffix um, so the the action on morphisms the codeine and co-multiplication etc um, are very uh, similar to before uh, you just carry on so this is the only place really where we say anything about the labels other than that they're just sort of carried along um, and we will we will comment again uh, that we can arrive at this definition as well by looking at strategies in the n-round k-pebble game, much like we could look at strategies in the, the n-round arafoid frese game uh, to get this come on. And so again, this has this sort of robustness of having multiple ways to arrive at its definition. Uh, so I've just sort of summarized um, both on this page. Um, so you might like to pause it if I was going way too fast, which I probably was. Um, so this is what's nice here is that this kind of drives home the point is what we're doing is looking at things in finite model theory and then tidying it up uh, using ideas, uh, sort of semantic ideas coming from category theory, i.e. our whole picture we can condense into uh, the features of a, of a single categorical construction, which is this co-monad. So it tells us about these um, endmorphisms, it tells us about these forest covers, and it tells us about tree depth all in one. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning, we would talk about um, formulas with free variables and associated structures uh, with, um, with distinguished tuples. Um, and you, you can run exactly the same story. Um, so I could have just done it with this along the way, but it probably would have been more irritating just to carry them along. Um, so all we really need to know is what are N forest covers and NK covers. Uh, in order to make all of our definitions. Um, so uh, an NK cover of A with a distinguished tuple A bar uh, is just an N plus L K cover of A, but with the it's a, it's a special cover of A where you have to assume that you've put A1 up to AL at the top um, of the forest. So I suppose that'll make it into a tree because they're all at the top of the forest. Um, and you just color A1, well, you label A1 with one and AL with L. Um, so, yeah, what's kind of going on there is everything should be able to see uh, A1 up to AL. So you can think about um, a formula with free variables as kind of being like a formula with um, not free variables, but you just quantified over those at the beginning. And therefore, everything should be in the scope of those. Um, and then the corresponding uh, co-monad we get, we've used the same label for because it's identical pretty much, um, is then going to be the, the sub-co-monad or the subset of uh, P N plus L K. Um, no, sorry, the definition's a bit wrong there. So that should say P N K and this should say P N plus L K. And it's all those sub-sequences which start with this sequence um, a11 up to ALL, or they don't necessarily start, it could be a subsequence of that. So they either start, they're, they're comparable with that. Um, and you can do the same thing for EN. So I just did the slightly more uh, complicated one, which was PN. Okay. Uh, so now we'll move on to talk briefly about the homomorphism preservation theorem. So there's going to be less detail in this section because there is a, well, there's a lot of detail on it in the paper um, because it's sort of technical and fiddly. So we're going to try and avoid talking about the technical and fiddly stuff. Um, so what is the sort of 
the the basic homomorphism preservation theorem. Um, so it's a classic uh, theorem of model theory, uh, is that if you have a formula preserved under homomorphisms, so that is to say, if A models a formula um, and there's a homomorphism from A to another structure B, then B must also model that formula. And I can find some existential positive phi, which also models, um, or which is equivalent to, sorry, I said phi, existential positive psi that is equivalent to phi. Uh, Rossman improved this um, by uh, by using uh, well by you can keep the quantifier rank constant. So if I knew that the quantifier rank of my formula that I started with, which was preserved under homomorphisms, was n, um, then the quantifier rank of the formula that I end up with um, is also at most n. Um, so the, you prove this, as you might expect, I suppose, by, you know, you, you use a lot everywhere, all of the um, definitions and theory from the last section. Um, so we can reformulate the proof of it, um, phrasing things in terms of the EN co-monad uh, rather than those sort of raw ideas in a slightly more uh, categorical way, I suppose. Um, so that leads us to the following conjecture. So this was from Abramsky, just the, the idea is pretty simple as well. We, we've got this theorem we proved using the EN co-monad um, and we have this other co-monad which looks very similar. So uh, can we just replace EN by PNK and get the uh, equi-rank variable homomorphism preservation, I shouldn't say HPT, I suppose it should just say HP um, conjecture and uh, which just says you can preserve as well as the the uh, quantifier rank the number of variables um, and get the same thing. And uh, so no, this is currently still a sort of conjecture in the general case. So we can prove it uh, in the case where n is not that much bigger than k. Um, so remember if n equals k, that's just the equi, uh, equi rank theorem when n equals k. So if n is a little bit bigger than k, we can prove it. So it's a slight refinement, uh, but not by much. Uh, so the idea is, can we just replace it? And the answer is not in general. So my story beforehand was that EN and PNK share lots of similar properties. Um, and in investigating this, we found one that they didn't share, um, uh, which is unfortunate because it meant we couldn't just carry over the proof. Uh, so namely, that is that uh, EN distributes over co-products in C sigma L. So that was why I uh, introduced how EN uh, acted on C sigma L, so I can talk about this. Um, so that's just to say, in particular, that uh, I can find a morphism from EN of A plus B to EN of A plus EN of B. So just as a sort of heads up, how what do these co-products look like in the category C sigma L? You kind of, you, you take the disjoint union of A and B, um, you then, uh, then you identify, so you take a quotient, uh, and you identify the elements uh, of the tuple of A with the elements of the tuple, uh, the corresponding elements of the tuple of B, and then the relations you take by just literally taking the disjoint union of the of the relations. Um, so we could phrase that um, in terms of just um, n morphisms. So the kind of property that we want is that if there is an n morphism from A to C and an n morphism from B to C, then there should be an n morphism from A A plus B to C. Um, but this fails in general um, in C sigma L uh, if n is anywhere bigger than k, pretty much. So if n is bigger than k plus one, this fails. Um, so just have a little look at the proof of how this um, fact works. Um, and what do you do? Uh, you take, so you take your, so I want a homomorphism from ENA plus B to ENA plus ENB. Um, so I take an element of it. Uh, and if, so this is a horrible notation, but it is sort of the correct notation. Um, so if the last element of that sequence is in A, but not, um, not one of the distinguished elements, um, then I just delete all of the elements of B to get a sequence of A. Um, and if it was one of the distinguished elements, um, then I just set F of S to be um, the sequence, the subsequence um, A1 up to AI. So why that kind of works is that this, in this case, it's kind of obvious why it works, I suppose, the fact that A and B don't interact. So I'm gonna preserve last elements of sequences, I'm gonna preserve subsequences. 
Um, and that's exactly what you need to, to be a homomorphism if you, if you go back and double check the definition of ENA. Um, and then this will also preserve last elements and it's also going to preserve comparability of sequences precisely because uh, all of the sequences were in the definition of um, ENA on uh, EN on the category with distinguished tuples are assumed to start be comparable to these sequences anyway. Um, but so what's going to go wrong when uh, we use PNK is there was that third condition in the definition is we needed to preserve comparability of sequences, we needed to preserve last elements, and then we also couldn't overwrite labels. Uh, so we don't really know what to do when we're looking at the distinguished elements um, and when we try and do this for PNK. And in fact, this just doesn't work. So we'll just give a counterexample in a second. So here we go. Um, so here's my counterexample. So this top one is my structure A. So if I have some relation R and it's just this three cycle, and then I have this seven length loop. Um, so I'm just going to move this. I have this seven length, uh, seven length loop. Um, so what's going on is, um, well, uh, sorry, I have my seven length path and then I have just uh, a unary relation on B4. And if I take the co-product of A uh, with distinguished element A1 and B with distinguished element B4, uh, then I glue this onto this along A, it's glued onto B, um, and the property is that A should now have a kind of path of three elements. So the, the resulting co-product will have a path of three elements such that the first element satisfies you and the second element satisfies you. Um, so that will, that will be satisfied by A plus B. But both A and B uh, map onto B. And, uh, but then A plus B doesn't have this property that uh, there is a path of three things with the first element satisfying you and the second element satisfying you. So there's no way B, um, this will be a formula that A, sat, uh, a plus B satisfies and B does not. So that's, you, you just can't have this uh, morphism in general that I claimed. Uh, so let me move this back again. Um, right, so, we're going to just give a very short sketch of the proof of the equi-rank HBT. Um, so we can reduce it pretty quickly um, to a slightly easier thing to prove. Um, so a formula is preserved under n morphisms uh, implies that it is equivalent to an, um, a positive existential formula. Um, so how do you do that? You literally just take the disjunction uh, of um, all of the n canonical queries and again we're relying on the fact that there are only finitely many positive existential formulas so this is a finite disjunction and it's pretty easy to check this satisfy this will this formula is well it's it, pretty trivial that it has quantify rank at most n and uh, will be equivalent to um, theta precisely because theta is preserved under n morphisms um, and then using the Comana, we can kind of reduce this one step further because we can factor um, a general n-morphism into uh, the, the special n-morphism from A into En of A, and then um, a homomorphism. So we would, all we need to prove now is that any formula preserved under homomorphisms is preserved under this particular n-morphism from A into En A of each A. Um, so we'll just give uh, another one more definition. Uh, so A is a grading elementary equivalence. So A is equivalent to NB if uh, for every formula in LN, A believes phi if and only if B believes phi. So this is not just positive existential ones anymore. Um, and why is this? Uh, we define this just to say this is now the um, more thing, another thing that we can sort of transport um, formulas in LN through. Uh, because obviously any formula of bounded quantifier rank is preserved under this thing. And um, so just we can use that to, to restate the HPT at the bottom there. Um, so because any formula of quantifier rank N is preserved under this thing, so being, we now need to prove that being preserved under this relation and homomorphisms implies being preserved under that, and that will be sufficient. Um, and just a few notes about this. Um, why do we talk about it? 
Uh, and why do we need this thing? Uh, why do we need to consider extra um, elements? Why do we need to consider uh, structures with distinguished elements when we, you know, we're not working in those categories at all? Um, and the answer is it's to build these um, partial isomorphisms, uh, which can be used to characterize uh, this relation. So this can be characterized by another version of the aerofoid frese game, um, where you extend sequences of partial isomorphisms. Um, and this, this relation, which should have an N here, sorry. Um, so if you have a morphism, an N morphism one way and back, then that implies a partial isomorphism between the distinguished elements, which is what we use to build on. Uh, so we use companion structures um, in order to try and do this. So if we want to prove being preserved under this move from A to ENA is um, implied by being preserved under morphisms, then really what we need to do is, you know, chase some diagram. So if we can find an A tilde and ENA tilde, uh, then that will be good enough. So we could just chase theta around there because it's preserved under homomorphisms and then through here because it has quantifier at most N and then down again. Uh, so I'm just going to give a very brief intuition on how you construct it because the, the, it's sort of quite detailed. Um, so the idea is to build a superstructure of A, which we'll call uh, sigma, uh, well, it's called A tilde, uh, which is very good at extending partial isomorphisms because then we'll be able to find this relation much easier. Um, and we do that by taking an increasing sequence of structures sigma i and at each step, we add elements from it in order to be able to extend partial isomorphisms that are involved with it uh, or involve sigma i of a. So we add elements so that it becomes better um, at extending partial isomorphisms. Um, and then if we take a co-limit all of those things, uh, it will be able to extend partial isomorphisms uh, from itself, uh, essentially, uh, rather than just for the previous um, um, structure in the chain. Um, and so I've just included a note here that we, we do in fact use these co-products a lot. Um, so I mean, again, these aren't structures in C sigma, so we need to uh, use this co-product over C sigma L um, and then uh, forget it back down into, into C sigma. Um, and ENA is constructed in an identical way. Um, and again, they're both very good at extending partial isomorphisms. Um, because they have a sort of basic relationship between them that implies this um, an elementary equivalence up here to complete the diagram for us. Um, so as I stated here, this is where it's not going to work in general for, for PNK. So this only works when, uh, again, N is not that much bigger than K, uh, so it's uh, smaller than K plus two, we managed to prove just by kind of fudging something through. So our previous gen more sort of general lemma that we needed failed about distribution over co-products failed when n was bigger than k plus one, but we can get one better. Um, so this is just a few comments. So uh, this is quite a complicated construction and a, a reasonable question is, you know, it, it does weigh more than is necessary. So for example, there's symmetry between en, a tilde and a tilde, and that's completely unnecessary. You know, they're both satisfying more properties than they need to, because they need to satisfy different properties and they satisfy all the same properties. Um, so we ask, like, can you tweak it? And it turns out to be quite difficult. So it seems every time you try and change one thing to get one property that you need, then you happen to kind of lose another one. Um, but it's not, uh, it's not necessary that this should work. So we have found a difference between the co Kleisley categories of EN and the co Kleisley categories of PNK. So it might be that that is sufficient to find a counterexample or force it, uh, force it there. So that's the end of my talk. So thanks for watching. Um, and yeah, just to say, stay tuned because there's hopefully going to be more work in this vein about co-monads and co-monads similar to these coming out in the future.